Okay, uh, good afternoon everyone. Thanks for joining us for the webinar today. Uh, on the line you've, you've got Adam Turgis, that's myself, the Lead Business Analyst at Solvexia. Also with me is Cameron Deed who is the Senior Consultant at Yellowfin. Just in terms of the agenda for today, obviously the, the topic is, uh, is data quality. So we're first going to start off by having a look at you know, why, why data quality is important within businesses and organisations, then move on to some of the best practices that we've seen working with various clients in, in different industries, have a look at both the Solvexia and, and Yellowfin systems in relation to the best practices, uh, and then end up with a, uh, a bit of a Q&A session and give people an opportunity to feed through any thoughts and, and questions that they've got. So with that in mind, uh, let, let's kick it off. Um, so. Just uh, by way of introduction, a little bit about ourselves. So in terms of Solvexia, six years ago, uh, a group of individuals from different industries got together and, um, and they saw a gap in the market. And really that was on one end of the scale you had uh, Excel and Excel spreadsheets, and on the other end of the scale you had uh, enterprise systems. Uh, and, and even though these systems were getting more and more sophisticated, uh, people still seem to be spending far too much time in, in manual and repetitive processes. Uh, so what we did was we created a platform to allow business users, so not just IT people, uh, but people from the business to automate uh, any stuff that they do manually, uh, and, and in doing so, free them up to focus on, on analysis uh, rather than what you might call cranking the handle. And it's resulted in, in quite significant improvements in data quality, as you could imagine, as well. The, the system can be described in three core components. There's the process automation uh, piece, which we just talked about data storage, so being able to store data um, within and from those processes, and finally the, the visualizations, what we would call online reporting and, and analytics. The, um, the first two in some ways can be thought of as, as data supply chains, so it's a term I'll probably make reference to a few times today, uh, and the third is powered by, uh, by Yellowfin. And on that note, I'm just going to hand over to Cam, who is going to tell us a little bit about Yellowfin. Thank you, Adam. Um, so just a quick overview of Yellowfin. Uh, Yellowfin's a global BI and analytics software vendor. So what we really focus in on is making the BI process easy, and that comes across in all areas of the application. So we're headquartered in Melbourne, Australia, uh, and we were founded back in 2003, uh, really in a response to minimise some of the cost and complexity associated with implementing traditional BI tools. We have over 700 customers in customers worldwide and over a million users, and our partner network um, is rapidly growing. Now, just to give you a feel for some of the awards and recognition in 2014, that what Yellowfin's received, uh, we recently were included in Gartner's 2014 BI and Analytics Magic Quadrant. Uh, we're a champion in Infotech's re latest vendor landscape report. And in the past, we've also been ranked as number one in Dresden Advisory Services uh, Wisdom of McCrowd's BI study. Now, we cater to quite a variety of different industries and uh, geographies, um, so lots of places, uh, lots of customers around the world. But some local ones that you might be familiar with are Telstra, realestate.com, Commonwealth Bank, uh, and Macquarie University. And one of our largest deployments is uh, with Census, and with that contains uh, several hundred thousand users, so quite a significant one there. So that was about Yellowfin, and now I'll pass you back to Adam to continue with the best practices. Okay, thanks, Ken. With the webinar being about data quality, we thought it would be a good idea to start with a, uh, a data quality horror story. Um, so one that we recently found was the, the London Olympics in 2012 where somebody went into an Excel spreadsheet and keyed in 20,000 instead of 10,000 uh, into a, a spreadsheet responsible for the ticketing for synchronised swimming. Um, the result was that they overbooked the event by 10,000 tickets and had to spend a uh, considerable amount of time, as you can imagine, calling up a lot of disappointed people that they wouldn't actually be going to see uh, synchronised swimming. Uh, on that note, so just a few intro slides to, to set the scene in terms of data quality. Uh, yeah, I, th I think the first point really is that your data has, has far more reach than you may think. So there was a study in 2012 uh, that found that around 69% of data, uh, primarily in spreadsheets, uh, was used at, on an in interdepartmental level. 
So it wasn't just being used within the team that the person was working in, but it was actually being shared out across the border group. Uh, and then further to that point, it was making its way up to the CEO in 42% of the cases. So your data is actually far more influential than you might think in terms of the, the running of the business. On that note, only one in 10 organizations actually rate their data quality as being excellent. And in terms of the business processing that goes into, um, into data, data quality counts for 20% um, of those costs. So you can imagine if your business process costs are $200 million a year, um, you're spending $40 million just on, on data quality issues. And in the US alone, around $611 billion is lost every year uh, due to poor data quality. So the numbers are pretty significant. And it's only going to get bigger. So in 2009, if you were to take all the data that was available and put them on DVDs, that stack would have reached the moon and back. Uh, and by 2020, that's going to grow by 44 times. 1% uh, of the data that we actually have available today is is analysed, so the other 99% is still there for the taking. And 93% and of executives believe that they're actually losing revenue because they're not properly leveraging the information that they collect through their data. For us, data quality is, is really a question of reliability uh, and, and, and a question of trust and credibility. So you know, how reliable is your data for making those business decisions? Do you trust it? Uh, do the people who receive reporting from that data, for example, think it's credible? Uh, good data really should be complete in its nature. It should be accurate, uh, always available, and, um, and, and consistent. And, and I think the, the reasons for data quality and, and sort of touching on from those previous slides is, is quite quite obvious, it really has a flow and effect throughout the entire organisation. So um, it will impact your customers and the customer satisfaction, uh, obviously efficiency to the business uh, in terms of the time re, you know, reworking uh, issues or fixing errors, um, and, and also the ability of people to make good decisions uh, based on good data. With that, uh, and through our experiences working with some of our clients, we've put together 10 best practices that we've found in data quality. Uh, they can be divided up into three broad categories. So firstly, going and, and, and getting the right data and ensuring that you always have the right data. Um, putting in measurements for, for the quality of that data. And finally, being agile enough to, uh, to react to, to inevitable changes in the future. So the first one is actually a broad one that probably encompasses all the others. Uh, it, it's what I'd title focus on the outcome. And, and for many, it's also obvious. but Quite often, people tend to start with the data and let the data dictate what they do, uh, and, and, and it really becomes a question of where you focus your time and energy. And, and it's important that when it comes to data and data quality, you focus your energy on the things that have the most impact uh, on the business. Quite simply, you should always start with the business outcome in mind, uh, then look at the data that supports that outcome and focus on what matters most, because that's where you'll, uh, you, you'll need to divert most of your attention. The, the second piece in terms of collecting the right data is, is profiling your data. So um, an invalid assumption is to assume that the person who supplies your data knows uh, what you need. Um, the, the, the cartoon that we've got up there is a common one that's used for, uh, for, for project management in terms of expectations and the different expectations people have. It's probably the same for data. Uh, so what we always encourage is that you take the time to profile your data. So those are things like making sure you've noted the structure, the format, the, the frequency with which you need it, the age, and, and how it's delivered to you. So um, you, you want to be sure that even if you get that general ledger data uh, as often as you need it, it's as granular as you need it as well. Otherwise, it, it's not going to be so useful. You want to communicate with the data providers, so you want them to know what you need, but you also want the opportunity in the future if any changes occur for them to, to, to tell you of those changes in advance. Uh, and you also you want to use it as an opportunity to identify issues and gaps with what expectations may be in terms of, say, the reporting end um, of what people are expecting to do with that data versus the actual profile of the data that's available. The, the next one is one that we see time and time again. Um, it's almost a game of uh, Chinese whispers is probably a good way to think about it. Um, and that's where your, your, your data is actually not coming as an extract from a source system, but it's in somebody else's spreadsheet that they prepare manually. I think the sort of the key issues there to really look out for is, is the risk, risk of human error. And, um, and the availability of the data. So from a profiling standpoint, uh, making sure that two or three months down the track, the person that's making that spreadsheet doesn't just decide to, to, to take it offline. 
or decides that it doesn't need to be done monthly anymore, it's now being done uh, quarterly, for example. When it comes to the data profiling, it, firstly, you always just want to be cautious of manual spreadsheets. It should really sound an alarm when, when one of your sources is a manual spreadsheet. Secondly, if possible, skip the spreadsheet as a source. So see if you can take the inputs that go into the spreadsheet as, as your data source. Uh, and then finally, just plan. So, so communicate with the, the data provider so you know in advance if changes are going to occur. Uh, and also put in measurements for quality as well to, to suit the situation. So you want to be sure that consistently month on month, for example, that the data is, is of a reasonable quality. And, and you focus more so than you would say on, a, uh, on an extract from a source system. Uh, an example that we have in, in, in this case is an insurance broker that we work with. So they had a, a CFO report that they prepared each month um, and they were, were using an Excel spreadsheet as one of their sources and it was extremely time consuming uh, because of the way that spreadsheet was being prepared. What we did was we actually worked with them to identify the fact that th that data in that spreadsheet was actually coming from a data warehouse. Um, so we could essentially skip that spreadsheet and pull the data directly from that data warehouse. Um, so, so essentially that spreadsheet became redundant for the CFI reporting purposes uh, and, and, and generally the level of quality in, in the data that came through improved as well and, and so did the time to prepare that report. Uh, the fourth one is about trimming the fat. So uh, this happens a lot of the time when you inherit spreadsheets, uh, sorry, inherit uh, reporting and processes from other people. Uh, so there tends to be a lot of redundant data that you don't actually need anymore, but people are too scared to touch. Um, all this does is it inc increases the complexity and the, the, the risk of quality issues. Uh, what we always recommend there is take the time to identify anything that's redundant and, and, and focus only on the essentials and, and drop the stuff that you don't need. And again, it comes back to time and focus. So by removing the things that you don't need, uh, you, you have more time to focus on the quality of the things that actually matter. Uh, in terms of data quality expectations, so we're now into the to the measuring category. Uh, the first one is really all about perfectionism. And, and I guess the point there is, your data doesn't need to always be 100% perfect. Um, and and perfection, perfectionism does and will lead to, to burnout. So really it's about focusing on what, what matters most and what people care about most. So the risk that people run is putting all their time and energy uh, into bits of data that aren't even used, for example, or really looked at in terms of a reporting standpoint. Uh, in terms of catching data quality issues, there's a rule in total quality management that uh, it's called the 1, 10, 100 rule and that's the, the fact that if you catch an error in your data at the beginning, it'll cost you a dollar. Uh, if you catch it in the middle, it'll cost you ten dollars and if you catch it at the end, it'll cost you a hundred dollars. So people are incentivized to, to find those issues as early as possible in the process. What we naturally recommend is any quality measures that you have to always implement them at the start of the data supply chain and, and also use the start as a refer reference point further down the line as well. So when, for example, you're looking at your calculated results, refer back to what your numbers were at the start as a, as a clarity check or a sanity check to ensure that your numbers are, are in fact correct. Uh, an example there is an Australian life insurer that we work with doing some sales reporting um, which required the policies to be assigned to particular sales channels. Um, so the, the checks weren't in at the very beginning. Um, sometimes the sales report would be done and, and the actual sales numbers would be different to the extracted information from the policy administration system. So what we did was we put in checks at the very beginning to identify any invalid uh, channels assigned to policies and, um, and use that as a trigger to stop the process and identify problems. So the cost of actually investigating issues um, was dropped significantly uh, because it was a lot easier to, to look at the source data as opposed to the final report. guidance in terms of what happens when you do find an issue. Uh, so what do people actually need to do to fix the, the, uh, the issue when it does occur? 
So firstly, you want to define metrics for your data quality. So what represents good, okay, and, and not good? Do it on a consistent basis, and when you do get consistent issues popping up, use a strategic solution to, to, to solve it. So for example, implementing some data cleansing, for example, to do a, a find and replace of data as it comes through, if, if, it's, if, if it's something that's happening each week or each month. Uh, so an example in our case was working with the Margin Lending Group. Uh, they were getting data from a few different sources around client transactions and um, and and their and their credit portfolios. Um, so so they had inconsistency issues. So every now and again the data was in a different format or had additional columns, and they also had text appearing in number fields. So so what they did was they they listed their expectations on the data quality. Uh, then they put in checks, um, relevant checks to make sure that it did. Uh, meet their expectations and it would alert people if something was off and they also put in data cleansing steps uh, into their into their automated processes to to automatically replace the text with numbers for example before it got copied into the process moving on to the the agility piece um, so it's sort of the final few slides the the first is I think we're all certain of uncertainty, so we know change is coming. Um, I think what divides people is some people plan for it and are ready for it, others uh, sort of just meet it when it happens. Uh, so the key here is to, to be ready for, for change and to expect, uh, expect it, uh, and not to design your data supply chains so that they're so rigid that when change happens, uh, you, you, you need to reset the entire supply chain. Our approach to this is fairly straightforward. Um, what you want to do is score and rank any potential changes. So focus on the things that are most likely to happen and, and would have the biggest impact uh, and plan for those changes. So again, it's about where you focus your energy, but if things are very likely to happen and, and will be quite damaging, you want to have a plan in place in terms of, say, transitioning. So for example, if you're expecting a, your CRM system to change and the data source is going to change, you want to be ready for that. Um, you don't want the system offline. For, for you know a month or two when you try and transition. Sort of continuing on, for the, um, on from there, when the change does occur, you, you really need to know who does what and how they do it. This is really a question of knowledge transfer. What you don't want is keep people leaving and taking the knowledge with them, uh, and then six months down the track when the change does happen, you're sort of back to, to ground zero. What we always recommend is have clear policies and rules on what people do when the change does occur. Uh, documentation is vital, so that acts as a way of moving information from people's heads and back into the organisation. Uh, and finally, track the changes. So make sure you can always go back and trace what people have changed and what people have done. The example that we've got is at a big four bank, uh, an actuarial team, that was sort of the core reason that they used us was they had high staff turnover and every time people left, they would take key knowledge about a monthly valuation process with them. Uh, so what we did was we automated their processes and, and in doing so, that transferred the knowledge back to the bank. So the next person, um, the next person basically came in and didn't skip a beat and the process just ticked on. So that's an example of the, the knowledge transfer aspect. Uh, and finally, the, with the human interaction, it's really a double-edged sword. I think people have a level of business acumen and understanding that you can't get from data. Uh, and what you don't want is uncontrolled manipulation of data, however, because that'll degrade the quality and the credibility of your reporting. What we, we suggest is create and facilitate a controlled environment for, for discrete changes. So avoid the uncontrolled manipulation of the data but allow people to go in and make specific adjustments and changes to the data as it tra travels through its supply chain. Uh, and make sure it's traceable too, so you can go back and, and, and audit who did what uh, and when, which will all add to the, the credibility. So what we're going to do now is just give you a quick demonstration of the, uh, the software. The, and, and that's both in Solvexia and, and Yellowfin. So just as an opener, just revisiting that slide from the beginning, the system's got three components. Uh, there's the process automation piece. So that first layer is all about helping business users automate their data processes. Um, users replicate their steps that they would otherwise do manually. Uh, and they do that by selecting from a, a library of around about 100 pre-built robots. And we'll have a look at that. Um, the data storage piece is handled by uh, SQL Server tables. So they're used to store data that uh, and combine data from multiple processes, for example. Uh, and then the visualization piece allows you to do some online reports and analytics uh, with data in those managed tables. And for that, Cam will, will give us a few uh, examples in, in Yellowfin. I'm just going to jump straight into the system. So the first thing that you'll notice is that the, the folder structure here on the left-hand side is very similar to that pie chart. So we've got our processes, our managed tables, and our reporting. Uh, I'm going to drill into the, the finance and actuarial team folder and open up a process called monthly CFO report. The, the steps that make up that process will appear 
uh, left to right. So in this case, it's a, a report going to a CFO showing forecast versus actual P&Ls. Most people that, that build processes in, in, in Solvexia tend to have some steps at the beginning that collect the source data. Uh, then they'll perform some quality checks at the beginning and then do some of the manipulation of data, do some validations and then distribute out the results at, at the end. In this case, we're also copying the results to one of our managed tables. Uh, in terms of the actual steps, if I st just click on any one of these steps to just give you an idea, Within the steps, we've got the robots that I talked about earlier. So what that is is a library of different, uh, what we call instructions that work with Access, Excel, uh, Word, and, and a variety of, of other data formats. Uh, you pick the type of instruction that you want. Sorry, let's jump back. And then, like in this case here, you effectively configure a layout on a screen. So this one's called copy cell values. And, um, and, and just going back to our earlier point, so there's no programming, it's all drag and drop. You, you, you basically configure that step, you save it, you lock it down, uh, and that step will then run in, in the way that you've configured it going forward. So there's three things that are happening here. Firstly, you're getting the consistency of the end-to-end -end process. Each step happens in the order that you want, want it to happen each week or each month. Um, you're getting the consistency within a specific step. So each step is done in the exact way that you want it done. Uh, and then the final piece is the knowledge transfer. So the details of this, this process are no longer in my head, but they're actually listed on the screen and the next user can come in and actually understand that process with a little bit of work and, and understanding. specifically analysing insurance data. And what I'm really going to give you a feel for today is how you could present that data within these dashboards and reports and really emphasise the interactivity and flexibility that business users really desire when they want to start analysing their data. So the first report uh, on the screen is showing the growth in actual insurance premiums per month. So this shows us a general trend over time. And from this, of course, we can see each particular month. If we're curious about a month, let's say September, we can then click on that and actually drill into the detail. So for this one, we're breaking this down. We're now breaking the data down by each particular state, and we're also looking at by, at by different dealers or brokers, depending on your terminology. What's normally a really good idea is to actually add uh, filters onto our dashboard as well. So Let's filter by New South Wales and Broker A. So once we've used that filter, uh, it's actually refreshed the data across our dashboard and we can see these totals have, have changed. What you'll notice is that you know, once we once we affected, uh, once we refreshed our data, that especially in this lapse rate movement, there was actually a bit of a change. So what lapse rates are showing are the loss of customers uh, or loss of active policies. So now what we can do is we can actually compare all of the dealers um, against a specific dealer, which was dealer A, to really get a benchmark for that particular, uh, particular dealer. We also have a chart to the side which is breaking down um, you know, what types of cover are most people taking. So predominantly it's life insurance, there's some income protection and there's also a few other different types as well. The final chart is assessing the change in the annualised total value of premiums for that particular month. So basically we start with our opening, which is the total subscription revenue on the books at the start of the month. Uh, after that, of course, we then have new business, so this is new customers um, that have signed up uh, within the past month. We can then also see increased premiums. This is basically additional revenue generated by an increase on existing customer premiums. We can also see decreased, which is the inverse of that. Uh, we can see our lapses, as we did before, and this will give us an overall total. So we'll be able to see what was the state of play at the opening of the month, and then what was the state of play at the closing. 
The next one we're looking at is actually showing you how you can present uh, some of the interactivity in terms of dates and analyzing trending over time. Now what's quite useful about this, these types of visualizations is that you've got multiple metrics that you can actually display. So for this example dashboard we have three core metrics that we can analyze. We've got number of policies, total premium collected, and the sum amount insured. Uh, switch to a different metric, so now I'm looking at number of policies. This actually reflects in the chart below. So really the interactivity of I want to look at a particular metric, it will then actually refresh and now show you that across the rest of your visualizations. Now common things that users would want to do is actually filter down to a particular time period. So they may hone in onto the last quarter. They may then be interested in seeing this in a daily perspective so we can now see kind of the variations across each day. Uh, and also we've got a general KPI report. So there's lots of ways that you can visualize this information but really people want to know the general change and the general trend over time. Now our final example is a Google map where we're actually showing this data by suburbs across central Melbourne. So we can hover over North Melbourne, Melbourne, and Richmond as an example. Uh, and what we can see is we can actually see the value of the premium collected for this year against last year. Um, and from that, of course, we can calculate the difference. So let's say we now wanted to see last year's total. Once we refresh that, the visualization changes. We select this uh, the actual difference. Then we can see that Port Melbourne, there was actually a difference between this year and last year, even though it looks good in terms of the total, there was actually a negative change on that one there. So that was an example of some of the dashboarding and reports and analysis you can actually provide. What I'll now show you is uh, the mobile piece. So of course a lot of people prefer to actually read information on the go. They may be, let's say, uh, in a business meeting and they may be in the boardroom and then they actually want to see uh, this information being presented. This is my iPad on screen and basically what we can do here is we can actually open up our dashboards, we can view them in full view um, and we can really start to you know, analyze that data. So these are the dashboards we created uh, across our device. We can view our reports, we can apply filters as we normally would as well. So examples of a map. Now in terms of collaboration, uh, you can use some interesting collaboration features like the whiteboard where you can actually draw on the image and then you can choose to send this image across to maybe one of your colleagues. Uh, you can also make comments across reports. So you may say, let's say, great news. And once you then send that comment, you actually be able to see that across all of your devices, uh, including your browser. So if we now switch back to our dashboard on our right-hand side, we will be able to see our comments. Cool. So we can actually see that flow through to the mobile device. So really all that collaboration that you're providing, the insights that people have, the ideas that come to their mind, really they are having the opportunity to do that anywhere if you're on your mobile device, if you're actually using your browser, um, is always really useful to have. So what I'll do now is I'll pass you back to Adam just to summarize the presentation. Okay, thanks for that, Cam. Um, so so what we, we've done is we, we've, get, we've taken you through some of our, our best practices are for, for data quality, um, giving you an idea of the solve access system and some of the capabilities in, in Yellowfin as well, um, in, I guess in the context of, of data quality, but also in the context in, in this case of the, the insurance industry. Uh, we'd like to thank you for, um, for, for putting aside some time to, to join us this afternoon. Uh, if, if anyone would like any additional information, our details are on the screen um, in front of you, so our website along with a, an email address for any feedback or questions you may have, uh, Twitter and, and LinkedIn as well. Uh, and, and yeah, so to everyone listening, have a, have a, have a great afternoon and uh, hopefully we'll, we'll talk soon.